On March 14th, 1963, CBS aired the Twilight Zone episode, The Parallel, about an astronaut who returns to Earth to find many things about his world different. Little details that indicate that he has not come home. It's as if there were, there were another world parallel to mine. As if this world were almost a twin. On October 6th, 1967, NBC aired the Star Trek episode Mirror Mirror, wherein a transporter accident during an ion storm sent four of the main characters into a quote-unquote evil universe. Something parallel. Parallel universe, coexisting with ours on another dimensional plane. On March 22nd, 1995, Fox aired the first episode of Sliders. The premise was that a group of individuals traveled to different worlds where history was radically different on each one. Something had happened in the history of that Earth that made it different from our own, and hoped that they might someday make it home. The same year, the same Earth, only different dimensions. Parallel universes are a common staple of fiction. Alternate histories of our own world to see how things could have gone. A single choice that could reshape the entire world going one way or another. Or even just other realms of existence that house things that we were never meant to know. Comics are no stranger to the idea either. On DC side of things, the DC multiverse has suffered a lot over the past few decades, originally starting out to explain why there are two guys named The Flash, leading into multiple crossovers between characters, and of course eventually heading into many company-wide crossover events. The end result is that the DC universe is frequently rebooted or retconned. The main timeline is forever altered, while the multiverse around it would sometimes be destroyed, restarted, and on and on. Marvel on on the other hand, up until 2015's event comic Secret Wars, maintained that the Marvel Universe itself would never radically alter, but that it did have a full-blown multiverse full of every possibility that could result from people's actions. In 1977, Marvel launched the title What If, a book that explored different outcomes for major storylines and events in Marvel history. Oh, and one time where Marvel creators got superpowers. That happened too. The point is that Marvel loves to explore the possibilities of what else could have happened in their stories. It certainly works as an ongoing anthology, but how about a book that follows around recurring characters as they have to navigate these endless possibilities? Hello and welcome to Atop the Fourth Wall, where bad comics burn, and especially welcome to my retrospective of Exiles, aka Sliders Meet Superheroes. First of all, my apologies to those who were hoping I'd be doing something on the Malibu Comics Exiles or the later All New Exiles that was published after Marvel bought the company. I know absolutely nothing about those and sadly will not really be going into that. Instead, the book we're talking about began in 2001, lasting 100 issues in its first volume and then two short-lived follow-up ongoings. The book had apparently been developed when Marvel was trying to make a new What If book, with Judd Winnick eventually landing as the first writer of the series. For reasons I never quite understood, the book is technically an X-Men book, since pretty much all of its members are alternate reality versions of X-Men with a few exceptions along the way, but we'll get into that later. I'll try to explain some of the context of the characters we'll be meeting, but even I don't know all the details. Part 1 is going to cover the first 61 issues, right up until a major revelation. So let's dig into Exiles, number 1 to 61, and introduce you to the Marvel Multiverse. <laughs> Linkara. 
let's meet our first exiles as they appear in the most dignified manner possible, falling screaming from the sky as they land face first into a desert. First up is Blink. Blink is the only character who had appeared, aside from their main universe counterpart, before Exiles. She was a character from the Age of Apocalypse storyline, which I've mentioned once or twice. More or less, Age of Apocalypse was an alternate timeline wherein Professor X's future son went back in time with the intention of assassinating Magneto for some reason, but accidentally killed Xavier instead. Magneto, inspired by Xavier's sacrifice, decided to follow in his footsteps and form the X-Men himself. But because of Xavier's death, Apocalypse began his plans early to, you guessed it, take over the world. Of course! Blink was apparently pretty popular, even having a miniseries that served as a prequel to Exiles, but let's leave things there for the time being. Blink is a teleporter, able to also focus the energy of the teleportation into small javelin-shaped objects that she can throw, teleporting an object or person that they hit. So if you're stabbed with one, you're teleported from being alive to being dead! Blink then meets Nocturne, the daughter of her realities Nightcrawler and the Scarlet Witch. I just realized that when you get right down to it, Exiles is just an excuse to write fanfic characters. Nocturne, like her father, has incredible agility and stamina, but her main powers are in the form of firing hex bolts, as well as, like Teen Titan Jericho, the ability to possess people. Next up is Morph, whom some might know from the X-Men animated series as that funny guy who died in the first episode and later came back, but that's another story. Although there is a quick bit of explanation with him and his name. When the character was originally introduced in the main Marvel Universe, he was known as Changeling, and like so many X-Men, he eventually died in convoluted circumstances. However, when the X-Men animated series wanted to kill off a character for their first outing, they decided to use Changeling. But by that point, the name Changeling was now associated with the Teen Titans character, so they changed it to Morph. You see how I managed to tie in all these retrospectives together somehow? Weird, isn't it? The name carried over when the character was then used in the Age of Apocalypse, although given the makeover of now looking like Observer from Mystery Science Theater, this version isn't from Age of Apocalypse, but he has the look. Morph, as you can figure out from the two names, is a shapeshifter, usually using it to serve as the comic relief. Next up is this big dude. Thunderbird. He's an Apache whose brother actually ended up with more of a starring role. See, the original Thunderbird was created for Giant Size X-Men number one, the book that reintroduced the X-Men in 1975 while adding a bunch of new characters. The problem they had with Thunderbird is that he was the malcontent of the team, the guy who got into arguments and snarked. Except they kind of already had Wolverine for that job, so they decided to kill him off to give a shock moment to the readers. The writers then used his brother to better effect later on. This version, however, is alive, and it's the brother who died. However, in his reality, Apocalypse transformed him against his will into one of his four horsemen. You know what's weird? Despite so many of these characters having connections to Apocalypse, none of them ever actually fight an alternate universe Apocalypse. I mean, unless you count all the end of the worlds they deal with, but there you go. Thunderbird's got strength, speed, and stamina. Nice and basic superhero stuff. Fifth up is Mimic, whose powers are a bit on the goofier side. Mimic in the original Marvel Universe is not a mutant, although there's apparently some contention about that, but was the first person to join the X-Men after the original group, and the first non-mutant to join. He could basically copy the powers of anyone close to him and retain those abilities while being away from them for several miles. They weren't as strong as the originals, evidently about half strength, but still pretty dang good. The Exiles version is from a reality where he is definitely a mutant, and the powers are restricted to only being able to copy copy five at a time, meaning he has to swap out the powers of someone else if he wants to add one. This basically makes him a slightly less ridiculous version of Combo Man, but otherwise Mimic in his own reality rose to prominence as eventually becoming the leader of the X-Men and helped make them a prominent force for good and mutant human relations. Finally, we have Magnus, son of Magneto and Rogue, master of magnetism, but he can't touch anyone without them turning into solid steel. Which admittedly means he's one of the few people out there who can stop evildoers with a hug. Magnus is not all that important right now. Who is important is the balding man in the middle of a kitchen that has no walls in the desert. They ask him what the hell is going on, and he is only too happy to tell them. They're all from different parallel universes, 
and they've become unstuck in time. Baldy introduces himself as the Time Broker. Time itself is like a living being. It has shape. It has growth. It spends way too much time watching TV on the couch instead of helping me with the kitchen! Imagine time as a massive DNA chain. Trillions and trillions of alternate realities exist along it in strands, and some of these strands are bad, like a cancer. In most cases, these are benign, but on occasion there will be a break in time that will domino across other parallel worlds, altering history radically. In their case, all six of them have become undone in time. They're never born, they've become villains, etc. However, they're all here because time is giving them the opportunity to fix all this. They have to go from universe to universe, correcting something that went wrong, and basically untoppling all the dominoes until their own timelines are restored. Okay, so it's actually a mixture of superheroes, sliders, and quantum leap. I mean, hell, the time broker is basically Al, given his fashion sense. If they're successful, they can be returned to their own realities. But they can also die, and if that happens, they'll be put right back into their screwed up timelines. Although logically, if the others in the group are still alive, couldn't they still correct the issues and restore the dead ones to life again anyway? The Time Broker gives them a device called the Talus. It detects what's wrong and gives them a very basic instruction on how to correct things. It's only so helpful, though, since the instructions are somewhat vague, like save this person, or let this happen, without giving them guides. The Talus is given to Blink so that it'll work along with her teleportation powers. Once they've finished a job, they'll be sent to the next reality. The Time Broker will not be coming with them. I don't exist in the conventional sense. I'm kind of like a living verb. The same with the desert here. It's not a literal place. It and I are constructs created from the collective consciousness of each of you. I'm how your minds are dealing with this trauma. Yes, I see. That is complete and utter bullcrap. I mean, you can be forgiven for not recognizing how nonsensical that is, since, let's face it, this is a superhero comic, so ridiculousness comes with the territory. But no, that makes no sense whatsoever. None of them would be aware of changes in their respective timelines, so how can they be experiencing trauma? And even if time itself is a living thing, and this is not just a metaphor, that doesn't mean time is a sapient thing that can pull them from their own universes and hand them a piece of technology that'll come in handy. And even if they were to buy that time itself was doing this, created from their collective consciousness, why do they have a collective consciousness? Why is the image conjured from their consciousness a short bald man in a beard with black eyes and their environment a desert? Even for comic book logic, the whole thing just doesn't stand up to scrutiny. And if that was the initial idea, then I really have to applaud them on that, because that's some damn good playing the long game. So that's our high concept situation. They're unstuck in time, if they solve problems, they can go home. And it's time for their first mission. They arrive outside Phoenix, Arizona at night and find a mall, breaking in and getting some new clothes for themselves while also doing research on the internet about this world. The Talus speaks to Blink, no one else can hear it, and explains that in this universe, the world had a zero-tolerance policy for superpowered beings, killing or imprisoning all of them for the last 50 years. And their version of the Marvel Cinematic Universe must be really boring. The Talus says they need to find the one who would lead them, so the Talus can give detailed history about this universe's sociological history, but it can't give a name and address? Man, I hope they fix that in the next patch. Anyway, they reason out that they need to find Charles Xavier, creating a crude version of Cerebro that detects that, indeed, he's alive and imprisoned in Nevada. Ah, so in this universe, Xavier took over Molossia. They break into the facility pretty effectively since... Well, there are no superpowered beings to stop them, and without people like Reed Richards or the like around, their tech level is not what it should be. They break Xavier out, and that's when the other shoe drops. Xavier reads all their minds and finds out their deal, knocking them all out. See, in this reality, Xavier wants to exterminate all of humanity. Whoops. I'm pretty sure they open things up like this to play with expectations of readers and remind them that these are different realities. Your preconceptions about these characters need to be thrown aside. Even Professor X is a murderous, genocidal madman in this world. 
The Exiles realize their screw-up as Xavier starts knocking people out with mind blasts during his walk across America. Realizing the tech holding Xavier at bay was way more advanced than one would expect, they track down the mutant Forge, who in this reality helped imprison and exterminate all other mutants to live a cozier life. After explaining themselves, Forge figures that what the message actually referred to was Magneto. Half the team goes to intercept Xavier and his forces, who plan to cripple the world's economy by murdering everyone in the New York Stock Exchange, while the others go to free Magneto. Unfortunately, they arrive too late. It seems with Xavier freeing people from prisons, the government decided to kill all the prisoners and let God sort them out. So the facility housing Magneto is going to self-destruct with an atomic bomb. I'm the government, I'm the government, I'm the reason nothing works. There's no time to collect the others to try to disarm the bomb and free all the prisoners, so Magnus decides to take matters into his own hands. He sends Blink and Nocturne away from the area while he uses his powers to shield everyone from the blast, transporting the prisoners away. Unfortunately, all he can do is contain the blast and dies in the process. Mimic, meanwhile, kills Xavier when he refuses to change his ways and swears to continue his murderous campaign. So, one for one, at least we're keeping things even. Magnus was clearly killed off so early in the run, much like the original Thunderbird, as a shock moment that sent a message to the readers. There are no main character shields in this series. Anyone can die. In some books, that kind of message can feel like a cheat, since superheroes die and come back all the time, but the thing is that in Exiles, these characters are unique variations from the main Marvel Universe. So death does have meaning in this, especially since we are going to get to know these people. Even Magnus, briefly as we had him, we get some character bits about his relationship with Magneto in his own world. It's not much, but you clearly get the idea that this was a character with a history and not just someone disposable, and that his death is a tragedy. Although for the other exiles, they didn't know him well enough to mourn long. All they could do was tell Magneto and the other prisoners about Magnus's sacrifice and hope for the best. However, the Exiles maintain a roster of six people, so before they head off to the next storyline, they're met by Mariko Yoshida, in her reality, the hero Sunfire. She adds flight, can shoot energy bolts, although she says that the Time Broker sent her and explained the whole unhinged from time thing, so that should be proof enough that the collective consciousness thing is bullcrap, since that means he was pulled from just her subconscious. Anyway, they move into the next story arc, an alternate reality version of The Trial of the Phoenix, a.k.a. the original story where Jean Grey died. A.k.a. where she didn't really die, because X-Men deaths and retcons are a really annoying thing, and Jean Grey in particular has a recurring joke about how many times she supposedly died. Even though it's only really, like, once or twice. Which admittedly still sounds dumb when a character dies for any amount more than once. Exiles is really the series where I have to go, TIME FOR BACKSTORY! So, here's the deal. The Dark Phoenix Saga is, to many, the X-Men storyline. The definitive, most known, and well-remembered. Long story short, Jean Grey was possessed by the Phoenix Force, a powerful cosmic entity that enhanced her psionic abilities to the extreme. Due to a few events that involve women in lingerie, because comic books, the Phoenix's more destructive instincts go nuts and she lets loose, eventually destroying an entire inhabited star system. The Shi'ar Empire, along with several other other galactic powers, decide that the Phoenix needs to be stopped before she kills anymore, but the X-Men challenge them to a trial by combat over Jean's fate. The X-Men lose, but Jean kills herself to keep the Phoenix at bay. And then, as I said, a lot of it was retconned and made even more complicated, and this is why these retrospectives end up being so damn long. However, that complication is really the central issue of this storyline. See, the Talus says that Jean Grey has to die in this universe. Everyone except Blink is okay with this, because they don't think that's the real Jean Grey, but in this reality, it is. And if she doesn't die, the X-Men win this fight, she survives, and goes on to become a demigod who will wipe out the Milky Way galaxy and eventually the universe. A bit unusual for Marvel, but a regular Tuesday for DC. A lot of the group are reluctant to do this. Like with Xavier, they're having a hard time processing the idea that they may have to hurt and kill someone they care about. Sure, it's not really them, but they look close enough that they might as well be killing them. The group decides that there must be another way. 
Mimic suggesting they go talk to the X-Men and explain the situation, and the Talus puts an end to that idea quickly, filling them all with visions of what will come to pass if they fail, the death of everyone on Earth, followed by the sun in a mere nine days. So again, nightmarish visions of the hellscape that will occur if they fail is perfectly fine, but go find Magneto is apparently more than the Talus can handle. After getting themselves ingratiated with the Shi'ar forces, the group gets some time to develop their characters. Mimic and Sunfire bonding over their broken timelines, Thunderbird unable to touch a flower without breaking it, Nocturne wanting to see her dad, and Mimic telling Blink that she needs to be their leader. While Mimic is the one with the most experience, all of them have now faced situations where they're emotionally compromised. Blink comes from a reality very different than the rest, and thus is more easily able to keep herself focused on the task at hand. Mimic even mentions how unbalanced it feels having to have killed the other universe's Xavier. Anyway, the battle goes fairly well, them disabling each X-Man, and then things go south as Dark Phoenix emerges and kills Cyclops. With the help of this universe's Wolverine, they manage to stab Phoenix and end the threat. Man, it's shocking how easily all their problems are solved by stabbing the people they love. Things get a little easier for the team, and less murdery, in their next mission, where they encounter the Hulk, who's being pursued by Canadian superhero team Alpha Flight. Like before, the Talus is unable to give a lot of information other than keep Alpha Flight and the other heroes they've gathered from being killed. Character development once again comes in the downtime, first for Thunderbird as he meets an alternate universe version of himself who's had a few better breaks than him. Apparently both versions of their father were abusive to him. The Exiles version took the verbal harassment to heart and filled him with self-loathing, while this universe version met up with a guy named Shaman who helped him be at peace with himself. He offers advice and help to the guy, but enough about introspection, we've got Blink and Mimic making out. Their relationship, for its ups and downs, would last for most of the book. However, more interestingly to the long term of the book is another group led by Sabretooth, whose mission is to take the Hulk at least until he sees Blink and recognizes that she's got a talus. Issue 7 is a done-in-one as part of a non-event Marvel did at the time called Nuff Said, wherein Marvel's creators were challenged to tell an issue without any dialogue balloons. Oh, so that's why Marvel number 3 has all the dialogue just crammed into the side of the pages! Actually, it was more about telling a story without any text, and in this case, the issue explores some of the fears of the Exiles through their dreams. It's your standard stuff. Romantic fears, existential horror, the usual. Issue 8 brings us a montage of their various activities over several months, some stuff being done fairly quickly, others allowing them to foil a bank robbery in an hour that gave them a week to relax, afterwards fighting a version of Spider-Man who was a demon. One more day in that reality is him making a deal with an angel in order to get married. And then the predicament they find themselves in for three issues. Prisoners of a scrawl conquered Earth, and forced to fight in gladiatorial battles for the amusement of the populace. Apparently in this world, humanity was conquered a century ago, and the place eventually lost any military value. So when superhumans started appearing, their use in combat became a thing. The story begins with the exiles there for a month, the only ones to have escaped this fate being Blink and Morph. Fortunately, they do not have to do some complicated rescue in order to get them, because pretty soon all the Skrulls leave. In a big hurry. See, they just detected Galactus approaching with his herald, Terax. Also, Mimic and Blink weren't the only exiles starting romantic liaisons. Nocturne is pregnant, having gotten together with Thunderbird. Man, custody proceedings are gonna be weird. The Talus' instructions were simply to save the world, so defeating Galactus is definitely the goal there. They come up with several strategies against him, thanks to the knowledge the Exiles bring with them, but most of it is for naught. They do manage to weaken him, allowing Thunderbird to sacrifice himself, placing an antimatter bomb on his back that, in one of the few times that has happened to Galactus, he thinks, you know, this planet is really more trouble than it's worth. I'm sure there's a Burger King or something down the street I can eat at instead. Pity none of them are from the main Marvel Universe. Then they could have just invented Twinkies to sate Galactus. Thunderbird is basically brain dead, and the Talus seems to think that's enough. Thunderbird is go. Uh, uh, gone.
Despite Nocturne screaming that they can't leave him behind, his replacement arrives, a being called the Sasquatch. Issue 11 takes place before that arc, basically a humorous little romp for character development between Morph and Sunfire, where we learn more about their backstories. In particular, we learn that Sunfire is estranged from her family, both because of her powers and because she's a lesbian. Moving on to the greater plot, though, in issue 12 we get a better look at Sabretooth from before and how he's leading his own team of exiles called Weapon X. They're made up of him, a version of Spider-Man called the Spider, who's basically mostly a symbiote, Storm, Vision, She-Hulk, or in her case, just the Hulk, and Deadpool. The thing is that the exiles try to do their tasks without resorting to more unsavory tactics. Weapon X, however, is more than happy to kill and maim to accomplish their goals. They've also lost more members. See, they call themselves Weapon X because their team was made up of people who had been in the Weapon X program. That's the thing that made Deadpool Deadpool and gave Wolverine his adamantium, in case you didn't know. But now, obviously, that's not the case. This Sabretooth is the same one who helped raise Blink in the Age of Apocalypse. So, apparently Age of Apocalypse just has all the screwed up time stuff. Sasquatch also changes form to reveal she's a woman named Heather Hudson. She's a more permanent member of the cast for a while. A scientist who made a deal with a supernatural beast called Tanarak, although she doesn't remember making the deal. Also, Nocturne lost her baby off-panel. There's no explanation given how she lost the baby, I figure it's probably to do with wibbly-wobbly, tiny-wimey antics with Thunderbird gone and crap, but the important thing is that there's no better way to handle such a traumatic event than to have it happen off-panel. Good one, Judd Winnick. We'll put that success right alongside pointlessly killing Omen in Graduation Day. Speaking of, yeah, Judd Winnick. I've bashed a lot of his work before, but honestly, Exiles is one of the things that shows he is a good writer under the right circumstances. Much like Titan slash Young Justice Graduation Day, there's a bit of a sarcastic edge to the narrative captions, but here it feels less out of place because of the way the book has been presented to us, with a mixture of drama and humor versus Graduation Day, where it was supposed to be this depressing, serious book where the narration was just tone deaf. Anyway, the reason why both teams are here is because it's a pretty big job that requires them both. This world has been overrun by Sentinels. Its only hope is David Richards, whose grandparents are Mr. Fantastic, Sue Storm, Jean Grey, and Scott Summers. Also, with this family tree, I fully expect Sonic the Hedgehog is in there somewhere. He's just a little kid now, living in a prison camp. They're able to bust in and free all the kids in the camp, but they soon discover that's not all they have to do. See, their mission is actually to kill David Richards. In time, yes, he would free the world from the Sentinels, but raised in an environment of constant deceit, hatred, fear, punishment, and confinement, he'll eventually use his power to enslave the world. When they get into a fight over it, the Time Broker steps in to explain the deal. Weapon X's job is to kill the kid. The Exiles were just here to free him. They can't think of any other way of solving this, but Sabretooth does. After killing Deadpool, though, because everyone gets a turn killing Deadpool. He'll stay behind in this reality to raise David and the other freed kids, hopefully steer them to something better. Following that is a two-parter that's more action-focused for the most part, needing to stop an alternate reality Namor from invading the world via Latveria. Character-wise, it starts showing how troubled Mimic is with all this. Seeing people he considered friends and allies acting like assholes is a bit frustrating, especially when it keeps on happening over and over. The next issue basically is there to fill in the details of the romance between Nocturne and Thunderbird. It's still not exactly clear how she lost the baby, but hey, at least we get details about how they got together. Because filling in character development after that character has died is a great strategy. I'm being snarky because, well, me, but honestly, this is well-written stuff. They next end up on a world where a lot of the West Coast has been overrun by lizard people created by Dr. Kurt Connors. They're there to prevent a bomb from going off and wiping out the lizards, done by Kurt Connors himself, who turned human again long enough to try to end his mistake. 
The parallel is set up between him and Mimic, only wanting to do good but ending up doing terrible things. Issues 18 and 19 see the team dealing with the interdimensional TV mogul, yes, seriously, comics are weird, Mojo. But fortunately they escape, the Time Broker promising them that he won't interfere again lest his own reality collapse in on itself. Next up is a three-parter that has a bit of a complicated backstory, so I'll save it for now. Needless to say, the world is overrun by a techno-organic virus assimilating people. With the main thing to take away from this is how Sunfire bonds with Spider-Woman of this reality, aka Mary Jane Watson. The really clever thing is how they resolve the situation. Initially, they thought they needed Patient Zero's blood for the infection to create an antidote to the living machine virus, but Morph recognizes that on world after world they visited, there seemed to be a distinct lack of Thor and the other Norse gods. As such, he manages to use the psychic abilities of one of the heroes of this world to contact them and plead for help, which of course they're only too happy to give. Unfortunately, the celebration is short-lived. At the end, the Time Broker appears with a new team member. Ilyana Rasputin, the sister of Colossus. No, nobody has died, but Blink has finished fixing her personal timeline and is sent home. Well, it's pretty sad to see her having to go like this. I mean, it's full of emotion and heart and heartache. So, let's check in and see how Weapon X are doing, eh? Oh, goody! A three-parter where they're helping a malevolent, power-hungry Tony Stark finish taking over the world, of course. In the intervening time, Sabretooth has been replaced by a version of Gambit and have added on a more jerky version of Angel. Vision is also starting to look a bit worse for wear, though I suppose that'll happen when you're an android hopping from universe to universe. You don't really get much time to buff and wax the paint job. They lose their version of the Hulk to the negative zone, replaced by a version of Colossus. Their actions actually inadvertently lead to Stark's death, but a lot of people die along the way. It's also the end of Winnick's run as a writer on the book, completing after 25 issues. Not a bad run for modern comics, but hey, fresh blood for a book is always fun. The guy who ended up taking it over, though, is yet another controversial writer. Chuck Austin. We haven't talked about him in a long while, but longtime viewers may recall him as the guy who wrote a story where an evil religious group tried to make Nightcrawler the Pope, a plan so idiotic that for the longest time it was the standard by which I measured moronic villain schemes. Austin does have his issues with Exiles, but honestly, most of his stuff is decent and introduces elements that will very much pay off down the road. He's off to a good start with issue 26. In this world, the Heroes for Hire, normally run by Luke Sweet Christmas Cage, is an international organization that employs every superhero in the world. Japan is about to get royally screwed over, with the entire country destroyed and their culture extinguished within ten years. According to the Talus, the Avengers are supposed to die trying to save Japan, and their job is to ensure Japan isn't saved. Sunfire does not take this well, but Mimic has been beaten down by all these recent events, especially losing Blink, and now he only wants to get home. Magic is all too happy to let it happen too, introducing a dynamic to the team that didn't really exist. She's the one among the group who actually argues with them and has looser morals. Although even Mimic admits that he's already compromised his morals a thousand times over and just wants the Exiles thing to be a bad dream. However, as Sunfire puts it, it's not a bad dream. It's a bad reality. And they either need to decide right then and there if they're going to be like Weapon X and just do whatever the hell they're told or do what they know is right and define themselves as heroes. The group splits off to do their own thing, trying to prevent the destruction of Japan in their own way. Magic is sent off to talk to the Avengers and explain the situation, but she instead goes off to kill the Avengers. By the way, this also leads to one of my favorite panels ever. The villain who's here to destroy Japan encounters Sunfire, Morph, and Nocturne, who declare that they're gonna help the people already hurt by him. Ah, I see. You weren't asking for my help. Rather, you were threatening me with some misguided declaration of heroism. That's Captain Misguided Declaration of Heroism to you, pal! His sidekick is Hyperbolic Reaction to Situation Boy! This universe's Colossus, who was a member of the Avengers, decides to help Magic if only because he has to believe his sister, murderous or not. 
And it's probably fortunate that Magic did do it, because the others were getting their asses kicked. The mission is successful and they move on, and on to the Exiles' first encounter with the main Marvel Universe, aka Earth-616 as it's usually referred to in comics. Unfortunately, it's kinda crap. See, as I said, we last met Chuck Austin when he was writing the Uncanny X-Men, and this is a crossover with his Uncanny X-Men book. It starts off weird already, because the Time Broker doesn't just explain everything to them through the Talus, but brings them back to the desert. He also mentions other Time Brokers, which really goes against the whole manifestation of the subconscious thing, although even Mimic had earlier stated that he doesn't buy that explanation anymore. It's a long story about Havoc being the nexus of all realities or some bullcrap, and having an evil alternate self who replaces him when he briefly dies. I don't know, it's convoluted even for this book, and somehow involves a subplot about werewolves or something. I don't know, like I said, it's just really rushed and lame. The only long-term thing with this is that Nocturne bonds with Nightcrawler, but since I mentioned werewolves a bit ago, we've got more Halloween ghoulies in our next outing. The two-part Avengers Forever. A Captain America villain who hasn't made the leap yet to the movies is Baron Blood. Who totally should. Why? Because he's a vampire. A Nazi vampire, even, which gives him a plus two villain bonus for wanting us to see him get his ass kicked. In the 616 universe, Baron Blood tried to bite Captain America's neck, but was saved by the chainmail in his costume. In this reality, not so much, so Cap is now a vampire here, and turned the other Avengers into vampires too. The Talus is back to being vague, saying they have to stop the Vampire King from releasing the enchantment that will enslave a city. Magic is starting to piss off the others more and more, especially Mimic, since she's always the one who wants to go to the quick and easy kill him and move move on route. They defeat the Vampire Avengers, including a vampirized Union Jack, and start teleporting away, but Union Jack is a bit of a sore loser, using a spell to smash their teleport, sending the Exiles into different universes for some character growth. Heather and Morph end up in a reality where Wolverine only recently escaped from the Weapon X program, so he's more feral than ever. We see Heather's backstory from her reality, how she ended up with Wolverine in her world, and how that Wolverine wore this costume. There. Sure glad I don't look stupid in this. Anyway, she and Morph survive and are teleported away. Nocturne and Sunfire end up back in the universe with the techno-organic virus, allowing Sunfire to hook back up with Mary Jane Watson again. And while Morph and Heather were only in that world for one night, the two spend six weeks there, with Sunfire and Mary Jane, of course, getting very close. And then the two getting teleported. Magic got off the luckiest, just ending up in the middle of an ocean for ten minutes. Mimic arguably got it the worst, six months in a world completely overtaken by the Brood, basically the Marvel equivalent of the Xenomorphs from Alien. Although in the Marvel Universe, the Brood, Colonial Marines, is considered to be the best game ever made. The Time Broker brings them all back together and onto a world where the Fantastic Four are just now getting created, with only the instructions, don't let anyone die. Considering so many of their missions have involved stabbing people, they're kind of out of their element. The job is easier said than done, since in this version, Ben Grimm's transformation into the Thing makes him more like the Hulk. And unfortunately, much like how this is the beginning of the Fantastic Four in this universe, it doesn't have any other superheroes yet to help stop him. Things are not made any better when Mimic is knocked aside hard while out of his Colossus mode. He reveals to Heather that he wasn't in the Brood reality for six months, but four years, and he's already been implanted by brood eggs that will transform him into one. His healing factor was fighting them off, but with the damage to his body, that suddenly became a priority and he starts transforming. Fortunately, they at least get the thing under control so he's able to come help, but the damage is done before they're able to cure Mimic. While he was under brood control, Mimic kills Sunfire. However, much to the amazement of the others, the new teammate who arrives to replace her is Blink. Let's cut away from them for a bit, though, and back to Weapon X. 
really feels like some wires got crossed, since the Colossus who joined them before is more of the heroic type, not wanting to resort to killing. Still, they've also swapped out their angel for a more psychotic Miss Marvel, but on this latest excursion, Storm dies. She's replaced by Hyperion, aka Superman if we want to have crossovers with DC that aren't really crossovers. And this is the turning point for a lot of storylines in Exiles. This reality just saw the death of the X-Men at the hands of the Sentinels, but Weapon X isn't concerning itself with that, just recovering from everything that recently happened to them. However, both the Spider and Hyperion are beginning to wonder, what happens if they say no to the Time Broker, actively refuse to try to fix things? And then Miss Marvel and Hyperion bang. Surrounded by dead bodies. Ah, so if Hyperion is the equivalent of Superman, then clearly we have found Frank Miller's Hyperion. They learn their mission, to kill the ten remaining mutants in this world. But Hyperion decides that, no, they're not gonna do that. Instead, they're gonna take over the world themselves. Vision refuses, so Hyperion destroys him, making the same offer to the others. The spider has his priority straight. Which option means I don't get to kill ten mutants? Can I at least kill some random humans to make up for it? Sure, more than ten if you like. Uniman! I like this guy. What's your name again? So, hey, I guess Deadpool didn't die after all. Hyperion takes out the Sentinels and soon murders the President of the United States, basically allowing him and his forces to take over. Unfortunately, it's a bit for naught. Magneto had sent Asteroid M down to crash onto Earth as an extinction event to wipe out all of humanity while he and his forces left for greener pastures. They fail to stop the Asteroid, which wipes out most of the Earth, although the remaining Weapon X forces and mutants go up to the rest of Asteroid M, still in orbit, to figure out their next move, which in Hyperion's eyes is... Well, kill the rest of the mutants and try this again in the next reality. The next two issues go more into Nocturne's backstory, basically serving as flashbacks to talk about her life before the Exiles. And how she was once part of a garage band called Butt Monkey. But let's get things back in order with Blink and the Exiles. Morph is really damn pissed at Mimic. Despite knowing that they were never going to be a thing, he was in love with Sunfire, so he blames Mimic for this, figuring that if he knew he had a brood egg inside of him, he should have killed himself. Mimic is, of course, not exactly in a great mood over what he's done, blaming himself too. Most of the first of this three-parter is character stuff, making magic more sympathetic, Blink explaining that she was sent to the same world Sabretooth was left in, However, they found themselves in quite a pickle now, as they meet up with Gambit from Weapon X. Gambit started lying to Hyperion about their missions to try to keep them distracted, while he and new recruits Hulk and Firestar go and do the job they needed to do so they could get home. But eventually, Hyperion caught on, shooting off Gambit's arm and a fight breaking out. Gambit's been waiting in the sewers for a month. The only instruction his Talus has been saying is, wait. However, the Talus has finally given him instructions. Of the twelve from the Exiles and Weapon X, only six can move on. The rest must die. Gotta love any competition where the reward is just as bad as losing. In the months since Hyperion took over, he's killed a bunch of superheroes and taken over Manhattan, threatening to destroy it if the president doesn't relinquish control of the country to him. The Talus is basically realizing that having two teams was a mistake. Seems more like having megalomaniacal Superman on the team is what did you in, but moving on. They come up with a plan to stop Hyperion without killing anyone. But Magic opts to join Hyperion, believing that the only way they can get home is to obey the instructions of the Talus. Unfortunately, when she explains all this to Hyperion, he just kills her and the Weapon X Hulk, figuring he'll try his chances again on another world. They take the fight to Hyperion, but he's clearly too much for them, and we learn why Hyperion's not really in a rush to go back to his reality. He killed all the other superpowered beings in his, even killed Galactus. And then humanity basically nuked Earth, killing everyone except for him. He's alone there, and all he felt out of it was boredom. Finally, it's down to Blink, who uses her teleportation powers so that Hyperion literally shoots himself in the back. Gambit gives off the final move, stabbing Hyperion's injured form with an explosive saber and blows him apart. The Time Broker appears to let Morph know his timeline is now corrected and he can leave, but he volunteers to stay, deciding that the Exiles are now his family, 
and that he forgives Mimic for what happened. With this, the remaining five exiles are given 24 hours to rest before their next mission and their new recruit. And a new creative team, as Tony Bedard comes on as the writer, and with him, the last quarter of today's part of the retrospective. Said new recruit is Beak from the 616 Marvel Universe. Beak does not have any special powers. He's a teenager who looks like a chicken and is married to a fly woman and has five kids with her. Characters introduced during Grant Morrison's run on X-Men. Well, actually, I tell a lie. Their first new recruit is Namora, a female version of Namor. The Talus simply says, Leave your possessions and earn your wings. Which is basically a flowery version of saying, Nocturne will stay behind and you get beak. Yep, Nocturne, for whatever reason, would go on to join the book New Excalibur. Because why not make the X-Men even more complicated by adding in Nightcrawler's daughter from a parallel universe? Namora, like her main universe counterpart, is an arrogant hothead, assuming superiority over everything around her. She's willing to kill, but she's more open to other options than magic was. Then again, she also eventually conquered the Earth in her reality, so she's got that going for her. After an issue where Morph's comic relief saves the day, we get Exile's 50th issue. And it's 51st, since it's a two-parter, where they have to reform the Brotherhood of Evil Mutants to spring Big M from prison. They, of course, assume that means Magneto, but in reality, it's this world's version of Mimic. And it's all a lie. The psychic named Destiny was able to predict the Exile's arrival and had Mystique swap places with her. They want to free Mimic with their help, but once he does get out, he uses psychic abilities he borrowed from Xavier to read the Exile's Mimic's mind. And realizes that the only difference in life between the two was that when Xavier offered him a better life, he said no instead of yes, keeping him in prison and away from all the great things he could have had. And so, Big M instead went by his example and remade himself, founding a new X-Men-esque school. The two-parter afterwards doesn't do much for character development either, with a universe where the Earth is becoming a sapient being thanks to an interaction with Ego the Living Planet. Comic books, everybody! But that's more in line with Tony Bedard's style. The book during this era feels more like a traditional superhero series, with less focus on introspection and more on letting the situations dictate character direction. It's not an inferior approach, it's just a different way of doing things than what had gone before. And there's still character development going on. What does solve the situation with the living Earth is Beak, talking about being separated from his children and the fear of losing them. Blink even gets to speak to two Celestials, giant cosmic beings in the Marvel Universe, and they have a warning for her. Beware the Time Breaker. He is not what he seems. Wait a second, do you mean the guy who claimed to be a figment of their collective consciousness, despite that making absolutely no sense, isn't that? The next one is a humorous done-in-one about the butterfly effect, the idea of a butterfly flapping its wings causing a tornado on the other side of the world. In this case, the Talus orders them to buy the last cheese Danish in a store, and doing so results in a chain of events that prevents Earth from being invaded by the Shi'ar villain Deathbird. However, their immediate arrival into the next universe transforms all of them. The six become integrated into a sword and sorcery world, their memories gone of their past lives. Fortunately, their version of Spider-Man is there to explain. The area has been transformed into this world by a magician named Kulin Gath. But he's not in charge anymore. Gath transformed superpowered beings into monstrous servants, but when he tried to do that to Ghost Rider, it just unleashed the demon inside of him named Zarathos, who took over and is keeping things maintained on a larger scale. Gath himself is now working with Spider-Man to undo this, and they restore the group to normal. However, Heather is reluctant to transform back into Sasquatch, feeling something is wrong if she were to try to do it here. And we soon find out why. When she does transform, she instead becomes the Great Beast Tanarak. As I said before, she didn't remember making the deal with it, assuming it was radiation that caused the transformation, but now the beast is in control. And Tanarak's not nice. In their first mission with him, they were supposed to stop some scientists from accidentally igniting the Earth's atmosphere, something that could be accomplished with a conversation, and Tanarak just goes and kills them all. Aww, it feels like magic's back on the team. Good times.
Tanarak wants to return to his own reality to conquer it, but doesn't think it's worth following the Time Broker's games if there's a faster way. He recruits supervillain scientists in this reality to help, since the Talus says they have 21 hours before the next reality, but Beak is sent by the other exiles to contact Alpha Flight for help. While the scientists work, the exiles discuss the fact that something seems weird. The Time Broker usually appears to them when they stray from a mission, but he hasn't shown up yet to talk about Tanarak, and the missions they've been sent on have been more vague than usual. With the help of Alpha Flight's shaman, they separate Heather from Tanarak, who in turn is taken by the great beasts of this reality who are not happy with him. The next dimension hop, though, brings us to the beginning of our next big shakeup. Once again, they arrive in the reality Sabretooth and Blink lived in, but Sabretooth is on the run from a bunch of others. And Heather is gone. Long story short, when Blink rejoined Sabretooth in this world, Sabretooth had helped raise David into a better person, along with all the other kids, but unfortunately he was still just a bad seed and David swore to take over the Earth, using his mental abilities to take control of Blink and use her powers to kill people. Sabretooth had to kill him to save her and any other innocent humans. But now things start to get... weird. The Talus says the mission here is to kill Mimic. Hell, even the Time Breaker shows up to goad Sabretooth into killing him, but he refuses. The Time Broker just continues to grin evilly about this whole thing, and he says they'll be punished for disobeying. Leading into the final two issues, we'll discuss their return to the Age of Apocalypse. It's actually one of those times when an event actually tied in nicely to what was going on in the book. Marvel was celebrating the 10th anniversary of the Age of Apocalypse storyline, so the issues could serve the greater story in Exiles while also contributing to the celebration. Beak is taken off the team with little explanation and replaced with Holocaust the son of Apocalypse. The Time Broker says their mission is to kill the X-Men before they inadvertently doom this world, but Holocaust doesn't play ball, just flying off to do his own thing. He detects the Emkron Crystal, a MacGuffin in the Marvel Universe said to be the Nexus of Realities, which I thought was havoc, but whatever. Basically, it's an intersection of various universes. Holocaust intends to use it to conquer other dimensions, but one of the scientists working on it says they detect a resonance signal similar to the crystal. That signal is, in fact, the Talus. Holocaust believes that by using the Talus, they can teleport inside the crystal and travel to the Time Broker's location, something the Age of Apocalypse version of Beast had done to go to another universe. The Time Broker even appears to Namora to try to get her to fulfill the mission, but she ignores him. He does the same again when Magneto attacks them, goading Holocaust on, but Namora convinces him to stay his hand and not do what he wants. They succeed in teleporting into the crystal, and wind up inside a hallway made of crystal. Ending issue 61. And that's where we're ending for now. Tune in next time for a world tour of some of Marvel's various lines, more character deaths and rebirths, and the truth behind the Time Broker. Or should I say, Time Breakers. Hello and welcome to Atop the Fourth Wall, where bad comics burn. We continue our retrospective of Exiles. When we last left our heroes, they had figured out a way to teleport to the location of the Time Broker, the being who claimed to simply be a representation of their collective consciousness. And for someone who didn't really exist, he sure had a swanky crystal palace that they ended up in. They had also been joined by Holocaust, the son of Apocalypse. Because when your name already means the end of the world, it kind of limits what you can name your kid. I would have gone with Timmy, just for the confused looks on people's faces. So let's dig into the rest of Exiles and see what new revelations and new characters we'll get in the latter half of it all. Our heroes compare notes, with Namra saying that she thinks she's been here before, that it resembles where the Time Broker recruited her. Holocaust, of course, was just teleported in front of the others and given the speech, but Sabretooth says he and Weapon X were dumped in the middle of an ocean, with the Time Broker showing up in a boat with some beer for their recruitment speech. Here, have a brewski while I tell you about how your personal timeline has been undone and you need to kill people, bro. 
The group explores the place, discovering monitors that observe various parallel universes, doorways leading to places like the desert the Exiles were first recruited, but most importantly, they discover a hallway full of bodies. The bodies of fallen Exiles and Weapon X members, including Thunderbird, Sunfire, and this dude who had a buzzsaw-shaped Captain America shield stuck in his stomach! I mean, for crying out loud, they just left that in there! Ugh, I don't like the Time Broker's healthcare plan. They also discover a hole in the wall where a body should be, as well as Beak and Heather, who of course were not dead when they last met. At first they want to break them out, but realize they may be on some form of life support that could be interrupted if they're removed. They're soon not alone though, as a two foot tall bug creature suddenly walks out to examine the hallway. The group jumps it, thinking it's the Time Broker, but the creature says he doesn't understand anything about what they're talking about, saying it's just a member of the worker cast, and it can take them to its leader. It brings them to the control center, where they teleport inside of the locked door to find more bugs, these ones resembling grasshoppers. The bugs apologize upon seeing them, saying they never meant any harm and only wanted to help. Blink demands to see the Time Broker, but a new figure emerges, saying there isn't a Time Broker. That figure is Hyperion, the same one they barely managed to defeat from Weapon X. He's alive and says that he's running things around here now, planning for every Earth in the multiverse to call him God. Holocaust attacks, but Hyperion is too powerful even for him. He says he deliberately put Holocaust on the team to make things tougher for the Exiles, but he just ended up working with them instead. And since Holocaust is living energy, Hyperion smashes his containment bubble and snorts the energy of Holocaust into him. I see the Ultimate Warrior was teaching people how to use Skronk as a superpower. The Exiles run like hell, Hyperion in pursuit, while one of the Grasshoppers tells the worker bug from before that he has to free the one who can save the multiverse from Hyperion. The group head for the desert environment, figuring that a nice big open space with room to maneuver would be good while they thought of a plan. Hyperion catches up with them, and, since he hasn't had anyone to talk to in quite a while who wasn't an insect, decides to explain what the hell is going on. The reason for the Hall of Bodies is because anything out of place in another dimension could cause residual harm to a world that's been fixed. So they pull the bodies or remains out and put them in the wall, possibly for sentimentality or guilt over having gotten them killed. Hyperion, however, isn't like anyone else they'd recruited. Like Superman, his body is essentially a huge solar battery, and the Crystal Palace puts out a lot of solar energy, so over time his body regenerated with all the pieces so close together. He broke out of the wall and took over, learning what the deal is with this place, called the Panopticron, or just Crystal Palace. The bugs didn't build it. They're interdimensional explorers who discovered this outside of space and time. They decided to study it and used it to launch expeditions into other realities for mapping purposes, but they made a mistake. They're not entirely sure how they did it, but they did something that caused all the damage to alternate realities that the Exiles have been fixing. The bugs themselves were incapable of doing the violent, nasty work necessary for the task, but they had equipment that could tell them what could solve it. And who could solve it? The Exiles are not unstuck in time. They could go home whenever. It's just the bugs needed specific people for specific tasks, and cooked up the story about time itself recruiting them, and that the Time Broker was their collective consciousness. My only problem with this is, again, the collective consciousness thing. The rest of the lie would have worked fine, but why was that more plausible than saying they were some benevolent power helping them out? I mean, they wouldn't even have to admit that they had caused the damage the Exiles were fixing. Just explain that they are explorers, and found out about the breaks in time, and thought to help them fix it. Otherwise, as I mentioned a lot last time, you have this story about a figment of their own imagination handing them a piece of technology that knew all and saw all. And yeah, they'd still question the story about them being benevolent, but at least there'd be slightly less suspicion about it. Hell, given the hologram technology used to create the Time Broker, they could have come up with anything else to be the one telling them all this. A more familiar face or something. But whatever, that's just my thoughts on it. We later learn that Hyperion's been toying with the team for a while. He was the one who sent them to the Magic World, hoping that their erased memories would get them killed. He was the one who allowed Tanarak to be in charge, again, assuming they'd be killed. When that failed, he recruited Sabretooth to try to make Blink a less effective leader, since she tends to defer to him because of their father-daughter relationship, and ordered them to kill Mimic. 
again, failed. Hyperion gives them a chance to join him, but of course they all refuse. Meanwhile, the worker cast bug goes to the one who can save the multiverse, letting him out of the wall. Beak. Behold our savior, everyone! The one whom Magneto once described best. X-Chicken. After all this is explained to Beak, he shares the same sentiment. How the hell is he supposed to save it? But indeed, the predictive algorithms that the bugs used said that the Panopticon was going to encounter some kind of catastrophe and that the way to save them would be Beak hence why he was put on the team. But the thing about Beak, as he points out, is that he's not super strong. He doesn't have heat vision or is super smart or anything. No, Beak's advantage is that he's really good at making friends. And thus the bugs show him how to operate the dimensional transporters and he recruits some friends, two other versions of Hyperion who aren't megalomaniacal assholes. With the help of the other two Hyperions, they finally manage to knock the evil one unconscious and drag him into the teleporter room, sending him back to the dead world he came from and ensuring he can't hurt anyone else ever again. The other two Hyperions were happy to help, though they admit they think the technology of the place has too much potential for misuse, wanting to take charge themselves, but they're happily willing to give up control to Beak, since he's just such a wise, helpful guy who helped save even their realities from the evil Hyperion. He gladly says he'll stick around to help out, but of course he's lying, so after they send the two home, he wants to get medical help for the others, and then wants to go home to his wife and kids. And after saving all of reality, yeah, he's probably earned that. So now the Exiles know the truth behind their operations, but while they were victorious, they were not unscarred. Namoro was killed in the battle while Morph and Mimic were severely injured. Most of issue 66 is the aftermath of everything that happened and bringing Heather out of the wall since, well, she's not dead or anything, and they need her help with the others. Mimic is alive, but his Colossus form is basically shredded. If he goes out of that form, the injuries will become flesh and blood and, well, he'll die. They pull a Stephen Strange out of a universe where he became a superhero physician instead of Sorcerer Supreme to help, but unfortunately, he's not able to do much. Mimic needs to absorb a healing factor to repair the damage, and his body refuses to grab Sabretooths, possibly because his physiology is too similar to Wolverine, of whom he has already grabbed the claws from. They put him inside the Crystal Palace walls to keep him in suspended animation until they can come up with a better plan. They also debate about what to do with the Crystal Palace. They're still pretty pissed at the bugs for kidnapping them and forcing them into this life, but the job's not done yet, and they don't know what would happen to the multiverse if they destroyed this place or forced the bugs to leave. Morph recovers, but insists their real first priority is burying the dead and healing up their other members, taking Sunfire back to the world with the techno-organic virus so she can be buried by Spider-Woman. They do have a plan to help Mimic, though. There's a world where Kurt Connors' regenerative formula that transformed him into the lizard actually worked properly and heal them, so they go to get some of the serum. Unfortunately, the world he lives on doesn't have superheroes, but instead just giant monsters that he and his team have to combat. Like Krakoa, the island that walks like a man! Although that's less impressive when you realize he still trips and falls like a man too. The giant monsters in this world are a natural part of the Earth's biosphere. Pathogenic monsters exist like a cancer on the environment and need to be fought, whereas antigenic ones are part of Earth's natural immune system, combating them. Connor's team exists to try to minimize the damage caused by the kaijus fighting each other, or whatever man-made thing they've come to destroy. With Blink's help, acting as a fairy sidekick to the monster Fin Fang Foom, they get Krakoa and the dragon to fight one another. Meanwhile, back in the Crystal Palace, well, crap goes down. Much like how Hyperion regenerated himself, the Deadpool that Sabretooth killed 50 issues ago by snapping his neck regenerates. Realizing that he has a healing factor Mimic could use, they free him, but people often forget that Deadpool is not a good guy. So when he hears about what's going on, he kills Doctor Strange and gets Heather to try to revive other members of Weapon X so they can have fun with the Crystal Palace's equipment. Beak has the bugs revive Mimic, though he's unconscious at first, needing some time to copy Deadpool's healing factor. Deadpool, though, has Heather revive the female Hulk, last seen being pulled into the negative zone, since she's the only one he knew who was still there. Mimic and Deadpool fight, with Deadpool hoping Hulk will help him, but she just wants to go home, and since she's a judge, she's the only one with legal authority to do anything about Deadpool's murder of Doctor Strange, bashing Deadpool to death. Gotta love the sound effect for the page, too. Hulk splat. 
Anyway, they send her home, and that leads us into the next big arc of Exiles, beginning with their tie-in to Marvel's crossover event, House of M. Long story short, the Scarlet Witch was convinced to alter the world so that mutants were the dominant force in the world. The end result of this was that the Scarlet Witch reversed it with the phrase, No More Mutants, reducing the mutant population to about 200 people. For about six years. Which, in terms of having a lasting impact on comic storytelling, means it might as well have been status quo for 50 years. They want to get Beak home, but unaware of the changes the Scarlet Witch made to the 616 universe. And yes, I know some pronounce it 616, but 616 sounds better to me, and it makes no real difference. The team are unable to get a clear look at it, so once they teleport in, they have to find a way to get Beak reunited with his family. But his wife doesn't know him in the revised universe, but that's the least of their problems. Yes, only in superhero comics is altered timeline that results in the unmaking of several children not the worst thing that could be happening to the main characters. In the House of M timeline, the mutant serial killer Proteus is still alive. Proteus was the son of X-Men ally Moira McTaggart, an energy being that could possess people, but burned out their bodies upon using them. If that wasn't bad enough, he also had reality warping powers that would make him dangerous enough without the body snatching. His life made him a bit unhinged, and it's no different here. He's powerful enough that he manages to steal the Talus, accessing the Panopticron's database on alternate realities, and uses it to teleport to other universes. But what's even worse for the team? He possesses Mimic, which effectively destroys his mind and replaces it with Proteus. Mimic is dead. Some commenters were turned off by Exiles because they felt it was wrong that they could so casually murder their team members. I disagree. It's not like they kill off members every mission, and there are consequences for their deaths. Death in a story should have meaning, have an effect on those around them. Even two years after Sunfire died, it was still having an effect on Morph. Now don't get me wrong, there are still problematic elements involved in these deaths. It's not like every character is getting some wonderful blaze of glory ending, but with death and resurrection so common in superhero books, it's nice to have a series where we are genuinely connected to the characters and fearful of their fates. Now that shouldn't be the only thing we're afraid of for them. If the only way to create tension is to fear that the characters will be killed, then it's poor writing. But all these characters have had other motivations, other concerns and hardships motivating them and influencing them. Exiles, despite some connections to the main Marvel Universe, still operates fairly independently of it, so it can be viewed mostly in isolation as a well-written saga that has a pretty damn long run with very few instances of it being bad or mediocre. Hell, I wouldn't even call anything we've had so far actually bad. Although rest assured, the book has a way to go. Anyway, with Proteus now able to hop universes freely, we begin a long storyline for the book. The World Tour, wherein the Exiles hop to various Marvel lines within their stable that don't get as much attention. House of M was only the first part of that, and yeah, it was a line. Even after the storyline concluded, for some reason they kept publishing material about it. I don't know how much actual interest there was in it, but yeah, it was a thing. Next up in the world tour is the New Universe. The New Universe was a line Marvel made in honor of their 25th anniversary in 1986. Yes, no better way to celebrate your birthday than by making something completely divorced from it. I kid, of course. New Universe was a pretty ambitious, interesting idea that sadly got screwed over, as is often the case. Since this was the 80s, comics were all about trying to be more realistic, so this universe would be identical to the real world until 1986, when an occurrence called the White Event gave superpowers to two out of every million people. This world, ideally, would have no magic or supernatural or otherworldly elements except for those created by the White Event. A world where superheroes were only just beginning to emerge. Unfortunately, because of cost-cutting issues from Marvel's higher-ups, the budget for the new universe line was slashed considerably, and they couldn't hire the top-tier talent they wanted to work on it, instead getting new, untested talent. That's not necessarily a bad thing, but when you're trying to create an entire universe from scratch, you kinda want some experienced people guiding things until the new people could carry it on their own. After some attempts at relaunching the line, it eventually ended in 1989, with a few scattered bits of it referenced, retconned, or new 
stories told since then in the last several years. But before we see what Proteus does there, an epilogue for Beak, who was left back home again with his wife after the Scarlet Witches, no more mutants. Thankfully, he and his wife are alive again, but without their mutations. Half their kids are also regular humans again, but doesn't really matter. The important thing here is that the dude who helped save the multiverse got a happy ending. Well, I mean, except for that nose, but hey, he got his wife and kids back, so I think that's a worthy sacrifice. Proteus's goal is to obtain a body that won't burn out. He's here for Starbrand, a character who wields a massive amount of power, but during all the fighting, he instead ends up in a character named Justice, who has the ability to summon up psionic weapons. Heather also contacts Mojo, offering up visuals of other universes for his interdimensional TV station. As I have to keep saying, comic books. In exchange for Longshot, the longtime enemy of Mojo, whose memory has been wiped by Mojo. Longshot has the ability to defy probability, or in other words, luck powers. The hope is that his own ability to warp reality to his favor will be able to counter Proteus's own reality warping. It works when their attempt to confront him on a dreamscape with another New Universe character, Nightmask, fails. Unfortunately, he just decides to cut his losses and flee to another universe. Aw, you mean Proteus didn't get to encounter Kickers Incorporated, the book about a team of football players who get superpowers? Yes, I will review this someday. Next up in the world tour is 2099. Yeah, I should explain something. Despite them going to stuff like 2099 and the new universe and all that, they're actually alternate versions of those realities. Split timelines that occur once Proteus enters and creates a divergence in that world's natural course. He's still on the lookout for a new body as he arrives at an Alchemax facility. So, this is 2099, is it? Looks like a crap episode of Doctor Who. Considering this was made in 2006, I was gonna ask if he meant classic series or new series, but let's face it, either way, the future tended to look pretty cheap. Proteus is still looking for a new body to sustain him. My God, what will it mean for the fight against pollution if he takes over Ravage? Actually, he's on the lookout for Hulk 2099, while our heroes devise another way of combating him. Proteus' weakness is metal. It's one of those odd occurrences where the Doctor Who reference is kind of hilarious, since Proteus is a foe who can be stopped with bullets. Mind you, that tends to kill the host body, so it's not exactly a great solution, but there you go. Instead, our heroes have metallic implants put into their brains to try to protect them from possession, with the exception of Morph, since his body is basically Play-Doh, so they just kind of shove a piece of metal in his head and hold it there, like a suppository for his brain. The group meets up with Spider-Man 2099 and sadly arrive too late to stop him from taking over the future Hulk. However, Proteus retains the memories of everyone he possesses, and that's getting in the way for him, because he feels Mimic's overwhelming love for Blink, and it's affecting him. Before they can take advantage of that, though, Hulk unmasks Spidey 2099 to the entire world. A bunch of the corporations of the 2099 world try to recruit Proteus to work for them for his knowledge of reality manipulation and dimensional travel, including Doom 2099, but Spidey convinces him that all these people will just try to use him, using his own backstory of being a forced addict as an example of them using people. Proteus decides to leave for another universe, and Spidey asks to come with the Exiles, both because of his exposed identity and because he feels responsible for sending him to the next world. So, Spidey 2099 is now a member of the Exiles. Kleenex! Third on the world tour is Squadron Supreme. I've talked about it before, even mentioned it last time. Basically, it's the DC universe, but made by Marvel, using proxies of DC characters that allowed them to have crossovers with DC without all the actual legal issues of doing crossovers with DC. Before you think that's a bit cheeky of Marvel, I should note that DC actually has their own too, the Champions of Angor. It's just they're not used as often, or if they are, DC just uses the villains of Angor, called the Extremists. So that's a thing too. Proteus arrives and aids the squadron in defeating forces of the world government that had been sent to arrest all of them. Long story, corrupt government, etc. This Hyperion is one of the two who aided the exiles against the villainous Hyperion, so it takes a bit of time to establish trust, especially when they learn that Beak isn't supervising them like they wanted. However, before Proteus can try to take over Hyperion, he dimension jumps again. The Squadron Supreme think the exiles will need help, so Zarda, aka Power Princess, the Wonder Woman equivalent, volunteers for the job. Next up on the world tour is another alternate future, from a Hulk storyline called Future Imperfect. 
After a couple of nuclear wars, the Earth is mostly devastated, and the only civilization left is run by a future tyrannical version of the Hulk known as the Maestro. And really, the only shocking thing about that to me is that the Hulk can grow a beard. Who knew? Professional sidekick Rick Jones has met up with Proteus, thinking he's just an alternate reality version of the Hulk, and recruits him to try to take out Maestro. Power Princess takes command of the Exiles, Blink surrendering leadership because of how they failed to take down Proteus, and because of the loss of Mimic. Zarda already proves pretty smart in her planning, deciding instead to teleport to the Maestro and explain the whole thing to him. He might be a tyrant, but he's not an idiot, and realizes the threat Proteus represents. Unfortunately, during the fight, they accidentally stab the Maestro, which pisses him off something royal, and they end up being distracted fighting him. During the fight, Proteus punches Morph hard enough for the metal piece in his head to get shoved out, allowing Proteus to possess Morph. Because of Morph's nature, his body doesn't start deteriorating, and he's only too happy to be in a body that he can constantly change the appearance of. He teleports away, bringing us to our final stop of the world tour, Earth-616. Um, well, not exactly. He's ending up on the Heroes Reborn Earth. To make a long story short, Too late! This was the world created when Marvel let Rob Liefeld and Jim Lee have control over the Avengers, Fantastic Four, Captain America, and Iron Man. This is another occasion where I highly recommend checking out SF Debris' Rise and Fall of the Comics Empire, where he gets into some of the stuff related to it, including some really shady things Liefeld did. But in story, the Fantastic Four and Avengers were supposedly killed while fighting a supervillain who emerged from the minds of Magneto and Professor Xavier. Yes, I will somehow review this idiocy someday, okay? In reality, they were sent to a pocket universe, which in turn was yanked out of that pocket universe and placed in the solar system as a counter-Earth, one exactly like ours but on the complete opposite side of the sun, masking us from seeing it. Like alternate universes, it is a common trope of science fiction stories, the other Earth on the opposite side of the sun thing, the difference is that there's enough proven science to say the idea of a counter-Earth is absolute bullcrap. I mean, I know this is a superhero universe featuring an evolved human who can become pure energy, who can warp reality to his whim while possessing the body of a shapeshifter from another dimension, but that's friggin' unbelievable! Dear Lord, I'm a dork. Anywho, Blink takes command of the Exiles again and has a plan to deal with Proteus once and for all. Zarda and Spider-Man retrieve a device from the Squadron Supreme Earth, a mind-altering one used in theirs. They manage to trick him into putting it on. Blink reprogrammed it. Proteus is still there, but his mind can only access Morph's memories. It's a tricky situation. They don't want to accidentally awaken Proteus, but it's awkward for them because as far as all the rest of them know, he is still Proteus. Still, the world tour helps show the team that they had a lot of work ahead of them. A bunch of worlds got screwed up by Proteus, and there were still plenty that needed help that the Exiles weren't around to do anything about. So they decide to stay on as a team including Power Princess, Spider-Man, and Longshot. Issue 83, despite some action bits, is another aftermath issue. In the wake of the world tour, they free everyone else from the walls of the Crystal Palace, save for Thunderbird, whom they still hope to heal, and send the living home and the dead back to their worlds, with notes saying that they died honorably and for a good cause. One thing that's never really explained is why the bugs put them into the halls like that. After all, what was stopping the bugs from doing what they said and sending people home? Blink, I can understand. She ended up solving the original mission of the Exiles and Weapon X by getting David Richards killed, even if it was years after it was supposed to happen. But if the bugs had the ability to put people back when their jobs were done, why not do it? Anyway, issue 84 follows up on that a bit. The Exiles all decide to check in on their own realities before getting back to their missions, but the Bugs are pissed that after the world tour and constantly focusing on their own lives, after, you know, the Bugs screwed up their lives, they're not immediately hopping back into saving realities. As such, they trick the team into thinking there's something wrong with Heather's Earth, then strand them all there, taking away the Talus. It doesn't last long, though. The next mission involves fixing a world where... <laughs> Okay, get this. Wolverine, Magneto, Quicksilver, Scarlet Warlock, and Mesmero were all merged into one being. You know, I didn't think you could get dumber than merging Magneto's and Xavier's minds together to create a supervillain, but there's always a universe out there to prove that, yes, it can get stupider.
This new being, Brother Mutant, was never meant to exist and now plans to kill all non-mutants. The bugs have done their probability analysis, as per usual, and all it says is that the solution to this is Wolverine. Their brilliant idea? Create a new group of exiles just made of Wolverines. And keep doing this, despite each time they do so, Brother Mutant just uses mind control on the Wolverines sent in. Realizing how badly botched this whole thing has gone, one of the Wolverines convinces the bugs to bring back the old exiles, who helped settle this. With the help of the Wolverines, since one was still needed to fix things. Huh. Didn't that Moarte jerk talk about these issues at some point? Wonder what an alternate universe version of him would look like. Huh. Oh yeah, Volume 3 DVD coming soon. With the Exiles back to saving worlds, their next mission finally allows us to get back to Sliders-esque shenanigans. Don't get me wrong, after doing their job for so long, especially with stuff like the World Tour and finding out the truth behind everything, it really shook things up, but the entire point of the series was exploring different possible realities, so it's nice to finally get back into the swing of things with that. And they've got a doozy for their return to active duty. In this universe, Earth has already been destroyed by the Silver Surfer. In this reality, Galactus is not the devourer of worlds, but a restorer of worlds, curing planets destroyed by some kind of cosmic blight. The Surfer joined up with Galactus in the hopes he might restore his world, but the Surfer's world was destroyed by its own hand, and Galactus doesn't resurrect any others, so the Surfer sets out to destroy anyone who supported Galactus, since in this reality, he's kind of a dick. The Exiles have to save Galactus, who's mortally wounded and in the care of the Shi'ar, from his renegade Herald. Sabretooth is the one who comes up with a solution to stop the Surfer, since everyone else in the Shi'ar just expected pure numbers to do enough against the power cosmic. Instead, he had Galactus take a chance and imbue him with the power, and since Sabretooth is kind of, well, a killer, he was more than happy to shred the Surfer apart. Still, he happily relinquishes the power back to Galactus so he can get back on task. Issue 89 takes a step back from world saving as we see that Thunderbird is no longer brain dead. He's still comatose, but he's dreaming, fighting alongside his group of exiles with a still pregnant Nocturne. Exiles Annual Number 1 brings us the end of Tony Bedard's run in the book. Heather observes a reality where the exiles are saving the day. Only problem is, it's the first group of exiles. The original team, including Magnus, Thunderbird, and the others from the start of the book. Yeah, it turns out Heather's pirated Mojo's broadcasts. They're watching a rerun. What actually happened was that the Grandmaster, a cosmic being obsessed with games and bets, had made a wager on the world of the Exiles' first mission. They screwed him over by helping win the freedom of superpowered beings, but he was intrigued by the Exiles, so he recruited a team of his own based on the originals, hoping it would attract the Exiles to him for another wager. He loses that bet, and the version of the Exiles he formed remain on that Earth to keep it safe. But yeah, new creative team as Chris Claremont takes over at issue 90. While the other changes in creative team had been relatively seamless, there's something about the transition into Claremont that feels... off. It could be the fact that for the first time in the book, a storyline is five issues long. The world tour was made up of several two or three parters. It could be that the first issue he writes is a little awkward in the dialogue, although that's to be expected as a new writer has to get used to these voices. It could be the way they talk, since Claremont will have a character loudly talking to themselves. It could be the characters suddenly having a training session out of nowhere, something they have never done before, and I really can't emphasize enough that it happens out out of nowhere. They're saying goodbye to someone, then BAM! Training begins now! And never really needed training, because they've always operated pretty dang well together, even when a new character joins up. It could also be that Claremont began sidelining long-standing characters of the book for his own preferred ones, but we'll get to that later, although all the Exiles writers had swapped out characters before. I do have to agree about the length of storylines, at least. Simply put, as cool as some of these alternate universe concepts were, they were really not compelling enough to support lasting for five issues. Even if you count the world tour as a 13-parter, they at least visited lots of different places to keep things fresh. But yeah, issue 90. During a prediction scenario that shows what would happen if Proteus regains control of Morph, they see an image of a woman at the end that they can't identify and the computers can't lock onto. This is just a hint for a later crossover. 
Power Princess decides to return to the Squadron Supreme to resume her duties, really for no other reason than, eh, time to go. The mission they go on goes badly, with only Sabretooth managing to return to the Crystal Palace. They recruit the Psylocke from Earth-616, because the computer systems say she's their best bet for this, Although that seems contradictory, since no technology can actually detect her. She has telekinesis, telepathy, and psionic weapons. I should note that she's recruited in issue 91 without anyone actually telling her any details. They don't tell her about the Exiles, what their regular job is, why she's apparently needed, just that she is and she accepts that. In fact, despite it being issue 91, we're not sure what the problem is or what's going on in this world other than a destroyed city, and Susan Storm is apparently Madame Hydra, with the ability to brainwash people into her sway. She also has command over the Hand, a ninja clan usually associated with Elektra and Daredevil. We later learn that the population of Earth is gone, a billion people rescued by Reed Richards and five billion more dead, but nothing else. No backstory about why Susan Storm became Madame Hydra, why she's so evil and yet Reed is still Reed, there's nothing! It's five issues of Psylocke expositing about her own backstory, and mostly just fight scenes. They have to kill Reed Richards, or else his dimension-hopping technology will fall into Susan Storm's hands. If they don't do this, the Crystal Palace apparently has the ability to delete the entire universe to prevent it from happening. That part I can believe, considering the bugs were able to do irreparable harm to other universes using the advanced tech they didn't fully understand. But we only get parts of this in tiny bits of exposition. It's like Whole parts of the story have been deleted in order to- And that's why Mr. T will be the best participant in Dancing with the Stars ever. The end result is that the universe seemingly gets destroyed with the exile still on it. But they're saved by Reed Richards, who somehow just had the universe blink out of existence and then come back. Again, characters will loudly exposit about their personal issues and emotions, but not about bigger concerns like how and why things happen. In any event, they're unable to contact Heather, and I presume Reed Richards is able to send them back to the Panopticon using the Talus. Unfortunately, the place is deserted. It's dark, the bugs are gone, and so is Heather and the equipment she brought back with her from her own universe. They're contacted by Icon, a hologram of Heather that's apparently a security protocol. Don't recall Icon? What? She's always been there! Yeah, your guess is as good as mine, people. She just showed up during the previous arc, no explanation of who the hell she was, and everyone treats her like she's always been there. It's not a plot point or anything, Claremont just seemed allergic to exposition that wasn't about Psylocke. Fortunately, it is able to explain what the hell happened in their absence. Heather drank herself into a stupor because of the loss of everyone she thought was dead. Eventually, the bugs just got tired of waiting for her to move past her grief and... left. Yeah, after everything that happened, all the time that they had spent with the Exiles Project, constantly badgering our heroes during the world tour to resume their work, continual outrage over the state of the multiverse, oh, I'm sorry, the Omniverse, as Claremont now keeps referring to it, they just decided to cut their losses and leave. Suddenly, I can believe that they came up with such an idiotic cover story for the Time Broker. Heather eventually got her act together and repaired all the damage to the Crystal Palace, but after what happened to the others, she was done with this, deciding someone else could try to fix the damage, going back to her own reality. The time differential between universes was about six months, so they get to work getting back to work. They get in touch with Heather, but she's gotten pregnant in the meantime and decides to completely retire from Exile's duty. Psylocke decides to act as the team coordinator in the Crystal Palace while she adjusts to working with the others. And along with everyone else, we're never given an explanation why she's still sticking around and not going back home, as the Exiles have to deal with a world that seems like it's in a utopian state. Victor Von Doom is leader of the Fantastic Four, people aren't afraid of people who look a little different, except according to Reed Richards, who is the Mole Man in this reality, it's all a big lie. Doom has taken control of the Earth and either gotten rid of anyone he didn't like, or altered the genetics of people who act in ways he disapproves of. Back in the Crystal Palace, a younger version of Kitty Pride appears out of nowhere. She calls herself Cat, claiming that all she did was phase through a wall and ended up here. There's also this very weird subplot about a man and a woman who appear to Psylocke and say that all of creation is going to unravel. And 
And if Claremont is bad at giving exposition, you can imagine characters are just as bad, because they don't give any more details than that. Longshot is the only one among the Exiles who suspects that something is wrong with this world, possibly because of his backstory related to Mojo. Unfortunately, it's a little too late. Doom manages to scan the Talus and decides to bring other universes under his control, sending agents into the Crystal Palace. They get a hold of Psylocke and Cat, but help arrives in a most unexpected form. Thunderbird, who has finally awoken from his coma and gotten out of the Crystal Palace wall. He helps save Cat and Psylocke, who are of course as much in the dark as he is, since, well, they're new and he's been out of action for 80 issues. Once again, the situation ends up being resolved with no real explanation of what the hell happened. I think we're meant to infer that Reed Richards broadcasts a command from Doom that gets everyone on this Earth to kill themselves. But it's really, really vague. And we never actually learn what the hell their mission was. And somehow this blows up the Earth! That's two missions in a row where the Earth is seemingly, if not outright, destroyed. Maybe Heather had the right idea and it's time to retire. The destruction of the Earth interferes with the teleportation signal to bring the Exiles back, scattering them across different realities like it happened once before. It's not that interesting though, and a lot of stuff apparently happens off-panel. Morph ends up recruiting a version of Rogue into the Exiles, while Spider-Man ends up retiring with some alternate reality Mary Jane Watson. This is in spite of the fact that Miguel is, you know, not Peter. Yeah, Claremont seemed a bit confused about that, because in the Doom world, he apparently also fell in love with a version of Gwen Stacy. Overnight! I thought it was just Doom messing with his head like he did everybody else, but nope! That was a thing that happened. Sabretooth ends up recruiting a male version of Mystique called, uh, Mystic? Mystique? Whatever, it doesn't have a U and an E at the end. Because poor literacy is just a sign you're in another dimension. If it seems like I'm being very quick and unspecific about a lot of this, that's because there really isn't much to talk about. Like I said, there's no actual recruitment that we see, just characters meeting and then suddenly later they're part of the team. Hell, Mystique's appearance changes between issues. I mean, he's a shapeshifter, so that's not too unusual, but come on! We also get some more of the mysterious man and woman, who claim they created several parallel realities. This comes out of nowhere and is never really followed up on. We don't even get to see a reaction from the others over Thunderbird being okay again. Oh, and lest I forget, Heather apparently just left Thunderbird there in the abandoned Crystal Palace. Thanks for that one, Heather! But fortunately, there would be some happy reunions for characters. Just, again, not in the way you'd expect. Before issue 100, and much like Chuck Austin, there was a miniseries crossover between Exiles and New Excalibur, that group I mentioned Nocturne had joined, and the other book that Chris Claremont was writing. X-Men Die by the Sword is a five-issue story that serves as a conclusion to the two series, well, sort of, since Exiles would actually go on, but apparently closed out the first volume, despite it taking place before issue 100. The good news is that it features the reunion between Nocturne and Thunderbird. In the intermediate time, Nocturne had a stroke, something quite rare in comics, actual realistic medical conditions occurring in characters and having to deal with the after effects of it. Oh, and by the way, the recap pages for issues 3, 4, and 5 of the mini misspell Rogue's name as Rouge. Because poor literacy is sometimes just bad proofreading. Look, the point is that X-Men Die by the Sword is really more for fans of New Excalibur, since I had no clue what the hell was going on. I'm sure it would make a lot more sense if I was a reader of New Excalibur, but it involves an interdimensional team of Captain Britons, weird cosmic beings wanting ultimate power, fighting against other people who claim to be protectors of the Omniverse, and this guy, who wears that suit and many others like it. There. Sure glad I don't look stupid in this. The end results of this are that Longshot Shot regains his memories and reunites with Dazzler, whom he had a relationship with. Nocturne rejoins the team to be with Thunderbird for like five minutes, but I'll get into that. And a character named Sage from New Excalibur joins up with the Exiles because of reasons. I don't know. She's an established 616 character that I had never heard of before. Long time X-Men stuff, but as I've said numerous times now, I'm not an X-Men fan. My apologies if you're a fan of hers, but me... When Exiles got to this point, 
I pretty much stopped reading. I didn't actually read Die by the Sword at the time, because I knew I'd be absolutely lost since I wasn't a new Excalibur reader. And shock of all shocks, I was completely lost when I read it for this retrospective. Let's cover one last thing before we move on to Exiles number 100, and the next thing that happened to the group. So, that mysterious man and woman, the final pages of Die by the Sword do finally explain who they are. Sort of. Not really. They are a tribute to Marvel creators Dave and Patty Cockrum. Dave Cockrum had sadly died two years previously, and Patty Cockrum, as far as I know, is still alive at the time of this video's creation. Yeah, there's nothing else I have to say. It's just a tribute to the two. They have no other actual story significance. In comic, they say farewell to Psylocke, saying they'll always be in her memories, despite her not knowing anything about them! Look, I'm not heartless. Both were close friends of Chris Claremont, and Dave Cockrum's passing was a tragedy. But they were put into this book with no explanation, and we're supposed to have emotional resonance with them leaving, but if they hadn't dedicated the final page of Die by the Sword to them, I wouldn't have known it was them! They played no part in anything! Their inclusion wasn't heartwarming, it was just confusing! But whatever. Exiles number 100. Big milestone issues like this should be a cause for a big event. Maybe a shake-up, or at least a celebration of where they've started versus where they are now. In some ways, that is the case, especially with Blink reflecting on how many they've lost along the way. But otherwise, a lot of it is just set up for what comes next. Sage apparently has some kind of war going on in her mind, a result of Die by the Sword. Nocturne still working out the issues with her stroke. And as a result of that, Nocturne and Thunderbird decide to retire from active duty on Heather's World, continue the healing process there. Blink decides to go with them, needing a real break from this stuff. And thus Marvel decided, Wow, a book that actually reached a hundred issues! We don't have very many of those anymore! Well, let's start the numbering over again! Yeah, I know, number one issues are a good chance to attract new readers and get a lot more money than that, but come on! Like I said, it so rarely happens for any book in the modern era. It's why I'm so happy that DC, as part of Rebirth, reverted the numbering of action comics and detective comics back. They're almost at issue 1000. Lasting that long should be celebrated. And it helps that both books at the time of this video are really damn good. But yeah, behold the new era for the team. New Exiles! What's new about them? Nothing at all! Claremont is still the writer, the team at the end of issue 100 is the same team. The only other thing I could mention is an enjoyable one-shot called Days of Then and Now, written by a guy named Mike Reicht. It is very enjoyable, basically about a character named Quentin Quire who goes on a hunt for the Exiles, looking for help for his world that's been overrun by the Hulk, who in this reality took control of an event called the Annihilation Wave. Long story, as always. The point is, Blink actually helps Quentin assemble a team of heroes from other realities to come to his world and assist, since his world was one that got screwed over. The Exiles were supposed to save it, but they failed them because they were too busy hunting down Proteus. It actually feels more like a proper 100th issue than the real one, since it celebrates the history of the book and the various worlds they saved, checking in on several that they visited. But yeah, New Exiles, second verse, same as the first. The first issue, though, does act as a bit of a jumping-on point, giving an explanation of various characters and going into them better than anything had before. Sabretooth also provides new clothes for some of the team, including this ridiculous tube top and tight pants combo for Psylocke. Considering her previous outfit was basically a one-piece bathing suit, I'm not sure if she's technically wearing less or the same amount of clothes as before. Oh, and despite the fact that the Exiles know there's something that's wrong that needs to be corrected, they still don't know what that is anymore. So basically, the premise of the book is now, go into other worlds and trip over stuff enough times until everything's fixed. Claremont seems to simultaneously know and yet not know the history of the book, since while they make references to past adventures on occasion, he forgets that the Exiles were supposed to be fixing realities damaged by the bug's actions. Now it's just generic, we protect the Omniverse and fix problems! Anyway, this world was devastated 50 years ago by a series of meteor strikes that caused tidal waves across the world, creating a new collection of kingdoms ruled by various figures. 
as well as a moon base because the moon is terraformed. It's a weird technology dichotomy that's suddenly introduced in the fourth issue and goes nowhere. It's here where we also get yet another new team member, a variation of Gambit. Only here, he's the son of Namor and Sue Storm, who in this reality is the only survivor of the Fantastic Four spaceflight, the rest having been killed in the meteor storm. How is it that this feels even more fanfic -y than the original team? Sabretooth loses contact with those at the Crystal Palace and decides they need to go back and figure out what's up. Gambit asks to come with them to learn and hopefully help his world when he returns. When they get back to the Panopticron, it turns out, according to the computers, their mission was to recruit Gambit. And after a few issues featuring this brand new team, the New Exiles, it finally clicked in my head the big problem with Claremont's run. The characters are all so boring! There's nothing to these people! Claremont got rid of the majority of the cast to add in a bunch of newbies, and there's nothing to them! There are no personality clashes, no real development or seeing a wide range of emotions from them, nothing really gone into about their backgrounds, no hard-fought battles of determination to show us they're badass. There's nothing in them that makes us want to care about them! Mystique! He actually uses his shape-shifting pretty infrequently, more tending to be there as the team physician and cook, since he's basically redundant when we already have a shape-shifter with Morph. Rogue has a cool look at the very least, but none of the angst of the main universe Rogue, and the cool look is lost later. The only memorable thing about her is that sometimes, SOMETIMES, it's implied she's Japanese when she uses the word Baka, and one time Baku, which is not the same thing! But that's it! Kat just appeared out of nowhere and refuses to give any details to the others, yet they trust her implicitly. I think we're supposed to care about Psylocke just because she's Psylocke, but her introduction was so badly handled, I don't get why she's here, and she has one plot line throughout Claremont's run, and it's dull and lame. And finally, the new recruit Gambit, who, I'm not joking, is Gambit in name only, because he doesn't look like Gambit, he doesn't have Gambit's powers, he doesn't have Gambit's backstory, so why did you call him Gambit? Oh, and like the others, he is not interesting! BE MORE INTERESTING, damn it! Ah! The next issue shows what was happening at the palace. While Sage was fighting off creatures resulting from the memories downloaded into her, again, it's part of Die by the Sword and is her entire deal in the book. It feels like she barely interacts with the others in this thing. Cat discovers some kind of weird portal that opens up while she's examining the tech of the Crystal Palace. She's had an affinity for working with it during her entire stay. And they somehow end up in some kind of weird fantasy kingdom where Cat's appearance keeps changing to other universe forms of Kitty Pride. Even stranger, this fantasy world has a bunch of technology ranging from biplanes to cell phones. Just like the other world they just visited, so it's really not even that cool a thing. We also see that Madame Hydra, the evil Sue Storm, whose backstory we never learned, is indeed alive and now traveling the multiverse recruiting people to her cause. For the Exile's next mission, it actually has a purpose behind it! Wait a second, an alternate world where they're given a goal that we're told from the start? What new spore of madness is this? On this world, there's a war brewing between Imperial France and the British Empire. The world doesn't have nukes ready to fly, but it does have super beings who will be the cannon fodder of the war, so they have to stop it. However, there are a number of subplots also going on. Psylocke learns that Slaymaster, a villain she knew back in the regular Marvel Universe, and an ally of Madame Hydra, has been going from universe to universe, killing off every Psylocke in those worlds. She begins training to prepare herself for a confrontation with Slaymaster, while Cat, back at the Crystal Palace, detects that several other dimensions have begun to vanish, unable to figure out what's causing it. Sabretooth apparently knows about Madame Hydra's gang, as well as Slaymaster's goal of killing all the Psylocks, and for whatever reason, doesn't tell the others, instead just going after them himself. Naturally, this is an incredibly stupid plan that almost gets him killed. The irritating thing is that the idea of Madame Hydra going through other universes and creating kind of like her own evil team of exiles or the like, you know, it actually kind of sounds like a cool prospect. But it's so poorly thought out because the motivations of the characters are so stupidly simplistic. 
According to the recap page, she wants to do it because of the Exiles' interference in her past plans. Yeah, if you can call the Exiles getting their asses kicked repeatedly on that world interference. Slaymaster wants to kill all the Psylocks because he wasn't able to kill the Exiles' Psylocke. That's it. There's nothing compelling or threatening about this, and everyone's dialogue has serious problems. Claremont writes dialogue in the book just a bit too verbose. For example, Sabretooth is not a proper speaker. He doesn't have to be. He's a rough-and-tumble kind of guy without an education who grew up in a post-apocalyptic, eh, play on words, world. So why is it that under Claremont's pen, his sentence structure changes? It's basically the difference between saying, I want a sandwich, and I would like a sandwich. If that makes any sense, it's not the words that are wrong, it's the way it's being said. Claremont's way of making Sabretooth seem less proper is for him to sometimes contract words with stuff like spose or an instead of and. But that doesn't make him sound that much different than the others who have the same overwritten way of talking. It's basically the kind of writing style you'd expect from 80s comics. And that'd be fine if this was an 80s comic, but it's not, so the style is jarring and feels wrong. Hell, I can give a positive example of this style being used. In case you hadn't heard, Rom is now back in action in IDW comics. His original comic was written in the 80s, so it had that same kind of 80s writing style, and it worked for him. The IDW comic wisely kept him talking like he does in the 80s, while the other human characters actually sound like people from the modern day. It works for him because it's consistent with his character, even though it's a reboot and he's an alien. Here, the characters all talk the same way, and it's boring! Even Morph, despite still injecting comic relief visually, is talking like that. Hell, they all start using the word devil as a generic curse word, to the point where in issue 16, two different characters let out the expression, THE DEVIL YOU SAY, instead of like, NOT ON MY WATCH, or NEVER, or something. Confusion is now proclaimed with, WHAT THE DEVIL?! And look, I'm the internet reviewer who refrains from using more intense swearing, but even I say, WHAT THE HELL on occasion. NEVER under Claremont's run. Anyway, back to the story. Cat goes to rescue Sabretooth, but somehow Madame Hydra has the ability to block them escaping back to the Crystal Palace. We finally learn Cat's backstory, although to be frank, it's not like she's done anything that made us want to learn more about her. She was a villain, sort of. A member of Emma Frost's Hellfire Club in her reality, but she never really fit in with them, ran away from X-Men villain Shadow King, and then accidentally phased through reality and into the Crystal Palace. Well, thank God we finally learned the shocking details of her past. I'm sure half of you out there were waiting with bated breath. The other half were going, wait, who's Cat again? We pick up on that whole Cat turning into other reality versions of herself, but the explanation doesn't really make much sense. Somehow, she thinks the collapse of the Omniverse is a result of the Crystal Palace. It's dying, and it needs someone like the Cockrums to take their place. Inside of it? Doing something? I, I don't know. I don't know has quickly become the catchphrase of Claremont's run. New Exiles also had an annual issue that is frankly much more interesting to us. It's still written by Claremont, but it's resolution on the whole Morph and Proteus thing. See, as has been pointed out by the characters a few times, Morph is effectively dead right now. It's just Proteus only able to access his memories. The world they come to has on it Valeria Richards, the daughter of Reed Richards and Sue Storm. But specifically, this one is from the Madame Hydra universe. She's looking for Madame Hydra, but hasn't had any success. This has nothing to do with anything, but she'll be back later. A godlike being called the Maker somehow reawakens Proteus, who decides to knock out the other exiles and do his thing. Only his own thoughts start getting mixed up, not helped by the Maker getting close to killing him. In his fear of not wanting to die, a shape reaches out his hand to him and offers him a chance to live. And Proteus accepts. It turns out it's the real Morph, who's basically been hidden away in his own psyche as a result of his own unique physiology. There's a part of Proteus that doesn't want to be a psychopathic killer, possibly a result of all the memories he's absorbed from others, like Mimic. So Morph offers him a chance for a better life. They share a body together, be a better person as one, or else they'll never be whole again. He accepts. It is, admittedly, a bit too pat of an ending for the Proteus stuff, especially considering we saw how deranged he was. 
But hey, it brings Morph back truly and creates some actual resolution, so yay. The next mission, and the final issues of New Exiles, brings us to a world where there are no continents, just scattered islands. There are also no superpowered beings, just cyborgs and Iron Man-esque heroes. The Sons of Iron and the Daughters of the Dragon. Just as your regular reminder that there are some universal constants, the Daughters of the Dragon basically all fight in swimsuits and thongs, while the Sons of Iron are all covered from head to toe. And yes, it's probably not that important to bring up for some random universe, but New Exiles is really, really dull, and I am desperate for anything to talk about. They encounter a Shi'ar Death Squad chasing after Deathbird, who in this universe is a good guy. The Death Squad includes this bug lady. You speak mammal as if you know me. Yes, bug lady, call more people mammals. What with your... insectoid mammary glands. I dub this Earth Bikini Planet. Oh, but we also learned that the Sons of Iron are actually Saurians, basically a race of dinosaur people that also share this Earth. Because lizard boobs would just be ridiculous. Bug boobs, on the other hand, gotta have more of those. However, the follow-up attack by the Shi'ar is aided by Madame Hydra, who gets killed by Cat, phasing through her and grabbing her... uh... spine? Tapeworm? I have no idea what I'm looking at. Whatever, she's dead and I don't care. Speaking of things I don't care about, Kat dies from the attack because of how much she had to put into defeating Madame Hydra. I guess she had this thing about wanting to be a hero to make up for being a villain? I think? Huh, <laughs> whatever. Being invested in characters is so old exiles. Psylocke defeats Slaymaster, who manages to escape, with Sabretooth exclaiming, What the devil? This book can go devil itself. And in a backup story that's been going on for several issues, Sage resolves her problems and takes the place of the Cockrums that had been meant for Cat, somehow becoming the computer for the Crystal Palace. Rogue ends up romancing one of the Saurians, even though they know each other for, like, a day, and decides to stay on this world. Morph will also stick around for a while to help things out since this is one of the core worlds necessary for securing the multiverse, but he says he'll be back. In the meantime, the Exiles meet Valeria Richards again. She actually came to join the Exiles in their final issue, so good timing there. And we get a big montage of events that occur. Missions they go on. Gambit needing to become a king again in his own world when Namor dies. Sabretooth and Psylocke getting into a relationship. And it all screams of, this was all supposed to happen much later, but our book got cancelled, so I'm cramming it all in here. But we are not done with Exiles. For you see, that was just the end of New Exiles. Thank God for it. Unfortunately, what was supposed to be a second volume of the book, a proper return to Exile's form, got reduced down to just six issues. Written by Jeff Parker, it's actually much improved over Claremont stuff, but it's not great. It was just getting started, though, so given time, it might have been fantastic. It's a real shame it got cancelled so early, and like the last issue of New Exiles, there was clearly a plan for things to play out over years that had to be condensed down for the final issue. Fortunately, they at least extended the book to double length for that explanation. Because of the nature of this iteration, I'm gonna skip the details and go just for the broader summary. A group of six gets assembled by the Time Broker, who here is Morph. The group includes Blink, who feigns ignorance of the Exiles concept. Like before, they're sent to worlds to fix problems, but by issue six, they realize Blink isn't telling them the whole truth, and they manage to get access to the Talus to go to the Crystal Palace. There they learn that there are multiple Exiles teams in operation, commanded by Blink, Heather, Morph, and Nocturne. Somehow, they were all pulled back to the Crystal Palace to find the new Exiles embedded in the wall. And apparently, Jeff Parker decided, you thought you knew retcons with this series? I'm gonna retcon every single thing you think you know about this setup. This retcon suggests that time itself is more like a crystal with facets. The more people go back in time, the more facets and fragmentations are made. You can't prevent fragmentations from being made, it just makes more. The best you can do is mitigate the damage to preserve a small part of it. The Crystal Palace isn't an actual physical place, it's just how their minds are interpreting everything around them. But once they become part of this area of time, they can't ever really go back to their own worlds. It just risks fracturing things even more. However, the multiverse is also cyclical and bending back upon itself. 
So the explanation for what causes the fracturing changes as the exiles or whatever time travelers do alters things. Think of it as a big circle. They can alter one part of the circle, but all it does is come back around again. Sometimes it's the time broker trying to fix natural damage, and he's just the collective subconscious of a group of people. Sometimes it's bugs. And sometimes it's the Cockrums. However, the longer you stay in this area, the more you get absorbed into it, which is what happened to the new exiles. Morph only survived because the area absorbed Proteus instead. Whoops! So much for that redemption arc, Proteus! The new group of exiles decides to continue doing their thing, to keep trying to preserve timelines as best as they can. Heather came up with a solution for dealing with the whole kidnapping people like before, doing so at the moment of death. That way, their effect on their own timelines was at an end anyway. Blink intended to fake her own death with the team and then go training more teams, but now Nocturne will go with them on their next mission while Heather starts getting another team member. This retcon... I don't like it. Don't get me wrong, it's imaginative, very complex, and shows some really advanced thinking, but I don't like the idea that ultimately the missions really are kind of pointless since the job is never done and the exiles can never go home again for very long. It feels like everything that came before was kind of pointless. They also don't address the fact that a bunch of their friends are stuck in a wall! For crying out loud, Blink, that's your father figure up there! Don't you even care? Ultimately, we do know that they get free of that wall, since some of them, like Sabretooth, end up back in their own realities, but it feels a bit heartless, and this final group of exiles seem too casual in embracing all this explanation and their new lives together. And that's Exiles! Even during the good parts of it, it is not a perfect series, but I love it. I love high-concept stories like this, especially exploring the boundaries of what-if scenarios, seeing everything we know get turned on its head, of real risk of danger and excitement and romance among these characters. The first 89 issues of Exiles are really damn solid, and I highly recommend them. As for why I picked it for a retrospective, well, my introduction to Marvel was mostly animated series. Spider-Man, X-Men, etc. When it came to comics, I was a DC guy, with only a few single Marvel comics here or there read. No series that really got me invested in it. But Exiles was my first ongoing Marvel series that I actually got into. Despite the fact that so much of it was completely divorced from the main Marvel Universe, it was my introduction to the Marvel Universe. And people have asked me to do retrospectives on various series and characters, but honestly, I try to either look at stuff that I find fascinating, like Rom, or more importantly, books that have a big personal connection to me, like Blue Beetle or Teen Titans. And Exiles has a personal connection to me. It may not have always been the best series out there, but it was a book that let you see heroes be heroes, make tough decisions, and use the best parts of a very eclectic team to explore the infinite possibilities of existence. And maybe someday, we'll see the Exiles again in some other Mirror Universe. Next time, however, it's time for us to once again visit Salson Publications, a source of plenty of pain for this show, with Reagan's Raiders. seen another world. I know they exist. There's so much more at stake here than our own paltry vendettas. We'd better get moving. After all, we have a job to do. Just kidding! <laughs> 
Hello my friends, please take a moment to like this video, subscribe to the channel, and click the bell for notifications on new video releases. If you'd like to support future videos, you can check out my Patreon or purchase a t-shirt via Teespring or Shark Robot. Thanks for watching!